Enjoy a summer of adventure at Camp Shelby, Cayman Turtle Center's very own summer camp for kids aged 5 to 12 years old. Learn about turtles, sharks, birds, and more. Explore the wildlife and splash in the pool. Campers can even take part in a special animal release. Weekly and daily passes are available this July and August. Find out more and register now at CampShelby.com. Good morning and welcome to the Green Scene, sponsored by the Cayman Turtle Conservation Education Center. My name is Gaddis Hislop. I'm the curator for terrestrial exhibits and education programs at the Cayman Turtle Center. And today we will be discussing a brand new book that's soon to be launched, A History of Turtlers and Schooners of the Cayman Islands. You may remember in an earlier episode, we, we discussed a program called Iron Men and Wooden Ships, The History of Turtling in the Cayman Islands. And today we are joined by Mr. Jerris Miller and Ms. Susie Soto of the Cayman Maritime Heritage Foundation to discuss their new book on the history of turtlers and schooners. So let's get into it. Hello and welcome to the green scene sponsored by the Cayman Turtle Conservation Education Center. My name is Gerda Sislop and I'm the curator for terrestrial exhibits and education programs at the Cayman Turtle Center. Today we're going to be talking about our maritime heritage. And with me today, I have Mr. Jerris Miller and Ms. Susie Soto. Earlier in the series, we spoke about our turtling heritage we under the topic Iron Men and Wooden Ships. We're going to be touching some more on that topic and talking about a new book that's being launched, being produced by these two special guests. So, Jerris and Ms. Susie, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Geddes. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to get to on the green scene with you guys who actually do quite a bit of our history and we're happy that, that you do so we're glad that we can add to it uh, as you said we're here to promote uh, the launch of our new our latest publication it's the third publication in a trilogy that the, that the maritime heritage has put together over the last 20 years and the launch for the book will be at the Cayman Turtle Center on July 15th from 5 to 7 p.m. and the entire public is is invited. Uh, having said that, the book is printed and we are, are seeking to do uh, pre-sales be, before the launch and if you're interested in getting a copy of the, of, of the new book, uh, a history of turtlers and schooners of the Cayman Islands. Um, they will be available online, and that is at C L M Publishing. One word: C L M P U B L I S H I N G dot com. And the contact person there is Karen Chin, and her contact number is nine two six two five zero seven. They will be uh, able to deliver the book to you. You'll be able to buy the book with your credit card or cash or however, however you chose to, or bank deposit direct. And Karen will see the, that you actually get the book in your hand. Hi, I'm Susie Soto, and I'm with Jairus Miller here, who gave me the job of doing some editing for this book that was started approximately 1999, I believe, Jairus, isn't that right? Yes, correct. And so it's been six years, I believe, since I've had it in my hands, and I've had, I am privileged, absolutely privileged to have been able to go through this and do the editing and adding some amazing stories of the Iron Men and wooden ships. Our schooners that have been uh, built here were incredible, and the, the seamen are famous worldwide. This book belongs in every home of everyone that love our Cayman Islands. All right. Thank you, guys. Good introduction. So let's get right into it. So can maybe, Jairus, you can start off. What was the inspiration for this book? Like how long, Ms. Susie said it, it started back in uh, quite a while ago. So what was the story behind this? Can you? Um, I've always uh, collected uh, nautical information from the time I was, I was young. And 
1998, when we formed the came with them, they came on Ireland's cat boat. Uh, we, our manager at the time was H. E. Ross, and Ross actually used to work for the, the Northwestern magazine here in Cayman before, and we published the cat boat book, and we published um, Love of Sales, and this book was pretty close to getting, to being published right uh, before Ivan, and then Ivan came. And Ivan destroyed our clubhouse and all of our computers, everything that we had. Um, I had one single hard copy of the book that I that I had actually um, kept. And we first we spent ten years building back our clubhouse, and then we put our attention on getting the book and you know published. And I want to say, I mean, you know, uh, Susan really doesn't give herself credit for what she has done to get this book on the table because for 20 years it didn't get published and there was a tremendous amount of work between having a manuscript and having a published book I never dreamed it was that that much work and that expensive to you know to get it there but Susan and the rest of the, the publishing committee she, she is the chair person of the publishing committee uh, but particularly Susan really put the work behind this to, you know, to keep it moving forward and to get it done. I mean, I simply solicited the funds to, in order to, to make it happen, but the actual work of putting the book together, uh, she took what we had and we added uh, another 100 pages of pictures and I saw from the National Archives and uh, some other stories that we had. And this is the book, I've, I've got enough left from my gatherings to actually do another book. And <laughs> so so that'll, hopefully that'll come along sometimes within the next uh, 20 years. But there's a lot, there's a lot of, of dig that along. <laughs> there's a lot of, you know, just dice stories about it. I, that'll keep your, I think it'll keep your interest. Um, we didn't try to make it a, a boring, like a history book at all. We, it, it is actual stories of things that happened during that era from which you can determine what, what the history was involved in it because they're, the seamen are very detailed when they give stories of, <laughs> of you know, what happened in storms, et cetera. So I, I think it'll be engaging to just about everybody. I mean, there's all types of stories in there. So the objective of this book was just to give people a, a little insight into what life was like back then. What they, or did you have a particular thing in mind when you were writing this book? Yeah, it was more, um, that absolutely was a primary, uh, you know, motivation behind it, but it was more just trying to get it print out and preserved before it was lost. Because in the 20 years, past years of gathering this, I'm saddened by what, what has been lost and people that, you know, that you could have talked to and got other stories. So it's important that if you, you know, you gather all, you get all this stuff that you, just go ahead and publish it at the end of the day, you know, because you did, otherwise, in another generation, it all disappears. I mean, it, you know, there'll be stuff in here that when they will read that'll educate her about her grandfather, you know, who, who did turtle in a maiden stuff. So it's, uh, that, that was, the, the real emphasis was just to get it out there so that it just didn't disappear out of the history books. Okay. Well, that's interesting because when, when the, myself and the education team at the Turtle Center, put together our, our research on the, the turtling history. Uh, and we started presenting this, taking it all to the public. The reaction we got was, everybody had the same reaction. Nobody knew some of this stuff. You know, a lot of the, especially the younger Caymanians, mm -hmm. were just appalled that, it, that they didn't have the opportunity to learn this thing in school. You know? So, Ms. Susie, when you, when, how did you get involved in this book? Well, this is terribly exciting. Because the people in here, the stories are told by each family, a lot of the families that have told their stories. And some of it is an incredible history of certain of the families. And for instance, Jairus's family up in Northside, they built schooners, uh, the Kirkconnells, the Fosters in Cayman Brack, um, the uh, uh, the Kirkconnells, the, the families. Um, in fact, uh, people don't realize what population 
was in Cayman, say for instance, 1903 to 1953. There was not that many Caymanian men here that were building, that were building ships, but you, people would not believe how many ships they built. I asked questions, and most Caymanians said, oh, maybe 10 or 20. There was one woman whose father was one of the shipbuilding families. She came pretty close to it, but there were 283 registered schooners that were built from 1903 to 1953. Oh, that, uh, what happened with me is I would sit in my office, Heber Arch would come up. I would talk to Heber and Dick Arch, whose, whose grandfather had a shipbuilding. Um, the ships are, are, the pictures of the ships are in here. We've taken them from the archives, the dates what they were built, the dates they were, say, some of them demised. The heart that is in this book, there have been grown men cry when they have read some of the stories. One of the stories, I was lucky to have some papers from the hustler from a Captain Connolly from East End who wrote about his friend that was Captain of the Hustler. Captain and Laurie. Captain Laurie. And he wrote about Captain Laurie, a eight-page letter, and it is all about how Captain Laurie was a good captain. Even so, they lost 13 people, and Captain Laurie was in demise. But he told why, and he said to Cayman, please, respect Captain Laurie, and that's how the weather goes. And it's, it's beautiful, it's totally beautiful. He tells of himself, I could go on and on, I, he tells of himself, he had an inexperienced crew, he put it in a different, more beautiful way, of talking about an experienced crew. I can't remember exactly what he said, but he said, he said, you boys, tie me to the wheel and go down below and block yourselves in, lock yourselves in. And he said, don't come out until the storm is over. It was three days and three nights that man was tied to the wheel. And he tells of that experience. And it's time the young people knew of their heritage. So it, it just goes on. I could go on for the next three, to, four to, hours or To, to speak briefly to what you just <clears throat> talked about in terms of the, the, the industry that oh. schooner building and came in with. That, that's over a 50-year period. That's over 300 boats. Those were the registered ones. They were over mm -hmm. 300 ships built. That's six schooners every year for 50 years. And these little islands, okay, and these things were shipped all over the world. I mean, people from Scandinavia bought them, North America, Central America, uh, Colombia, you know, uh, bought these, these ships that were built in, in Cayman. And an industry like that today would be a multi-billion dollar industry. Mm -hmm. Put the six to the eight or foot yachts, six a year. <laughs> I mean, that's, wow. and, and, and you know, we, we, when we transitioned out of it, I worked with a couple of governments to try and get them interested back in it because shipbuilding, it doesn't matter what you do, there's a job to do in shipbuilding. If you paint, if you pound hammers, if you're a computer wizard, if you're okay, I mean, if you're really good with mathematics and science, you can navigate it. It's just anything that in your normal day-to-day -day life that you can do, there's a job that you could be doing building a, building a ship. Oh, wow. So, okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take a break. This is a good topic to take a break on. And we're going to come back and talk a little bit more about shipbuilding. Okay, so you're listening to The Green Scene on Bobo 89.1 FM, and we'll be right back. 
Enjoy a summer of adventure at Camp Shelby, Cayman Turtle Center's very own summer camp for kids age 5 to 12 years old. Learn about turtles, sharks, birds, and more. Explore the wildlife and splash in the pool. Campers can even take part in a special animal release. Weekly and daily passes are available this July and August. Find out more and register now at CampShelby.com. Hello, we're back with the Green Seed. My name is Geda Sislop from Cayman Turtle Conservation Education Center, and I'm here with Mr. Jerris Miller and Ms. Susie Soto. And we are talking about turtlers and schooners of the Cayman Islands. Right, this is a, concerning the launch of a new book on our maritime heritage history. So at the last break, we were just getting into talking about schooners. Cayman, the Cayman Islands built an incredible amount of schooners over a short period, over a period of time. And we're going to get back into this. So Jarvis, can you tell me something about school? What makes Cayman schooners so special? What was it about it? It's the particular proportions of the boat. Cayman schooners were never built from a set of plans or anything. Okay? They were actually built from for those who are familiar, what you call a half a model. If you go into a room and you see a half of a boat model on, on the wall, mm -hmm. that's the half of the contract for the boat. Okay, but let, let's take the coal field, for example. You'll find a story in this about the coal field with the arches. They, had, they made 16 model boats, okay? Mm -hmm. And Mr. Cromwell in the stand, he wanted a boat. And you, they'd go, you go into the shop and finally you get one that he likes, or he might like the the body of this boat, but the bow of this one. So then they'll build another one like that. So finally, the person that's going to buy the boat, um, pay for the boat, agrees that's the, I, that, that's the boat that I want. Now that, they section that off and they scale that up to whatever size boat that you want, a six to foot, a hundred foot, whatever you, you, um, you, you, that, that you actually want. And then they take the model and they cut it in two. And the reason you see half models is because that is half, that's a contract. That was the only contract you had. You, wow. So when the owner got half of the boat, the builder got half of the boat. So when the owner comes to the boat, it has to be like a model. Okay. So that's where the whole half model, whenever you go in and you see half of a boat like on a wall, that's a half model and that's where the whole half model thing came, I mean, oh, came from in the beginning. That was a, what today would be a 100 page contract. And that was it. And they had, they built more from rules of, like I say, rules of thumb. If you wanted a six to five foot boat, say, well, okay, well, the keel, because of the ratios they would use, the keel had to be, say, 50 feet. The mast had to be, uh, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a proportion of the length of the boat, depending okay. on the length of the boat. But for a six to footer, your mast would probably be like six to five, 70 feet. And the, the, the rules of thumb that they call it, that they use for that, just created a beautiful looking boat that was pleasing to, to everybody. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why they all sort of were appreciated, you know, when they were originally mm -hmm. built. Now, one of the things that you'll notice about Cayman schooners, and in fact, if right on the cover of the book, you'll see two schooners on the cover of the book. If you look at the bow of those two schooners, one bow, one has a sharp bow, and one has what's called a spoon bow. Up until uh, the, 19, I think 1920, most fast boats around the world, the clipper ships, had the sharp bow in it. By the 19th, in the early 1900s, um, a boat named Blue Nose was built in Nova Scotia that won all the races that it ever went in. You know, you totally that. different design boat. It has what you call a spoon bow, and came on, the Cayman boat builders adopted it right away. So that's why like, the gold field is modeled after the spoon bow and that's why it's so fast. It's even faster than the other ones that had less leaded surface in it. And so you, if you see a picture of a boat, you know, uh, this, this, this is the Lydia B. And, uh, and she, you know that she, this one was built before, this, before the one with the spoon okay. bow because this was not even a boat design before the, it was done in Nova Scotia. And it's amazing the connection 100 years ago, 150 years ago, up until even like, 50, about like 70 years ago, between Cayman and New England. Because New England, uh, the codfish, the, the whole codfish trade, they had to get salt. They got their salt from the Caribbean, from the Turks and Caicos Islands, uh, a couple of places that they got their salt from. And uh, that's why today Jamaica codfish is such a, a dish. Now, although you can't catch codfish in Jamaica, <laughs> you know, uh, but they would come down again. When you're going back, 
to get back to the north from what you sail south into the Caribbean, you have to come by Cayman and go around Cuba and get on the Gulf Stream. You don't have to, but it gets you there a lot, lot quicker. Uh, so the, the Cayman was always a signpost in the Western Caribbean from actually just after Columbus uh, just discovered it because that was the way to you. You, you took a bearing from Cayman, if you could sight Cayman, you could know the compass bearing to go and to not run into the reefs in Cuba. Because it's okay. most dangerous Caribbean coast there. That's why so many boats got lost in Cayman, even the wreck of the 10 sails. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, they, they, it, they need to see Cayman to know. Because navigation those days was so sketchy. With the, you know, this was before sextants and everything. So I have a map from 15, uh, 1523 that shows Cayman clearly. They don't have the shape of Jamaica, right? That has only a uh, lump of sh uh, shape of Cuba, but it shows the Cayman Islands in the right place with a compass rose on it. So the Spaniards, their map people, put that, that was one of the most important. I mean, this little island was that important mm -hmm. because they, they, it, it, there's no other signpost in the Western Caribbean to know when to turn to catch the Gulf Stream, to turn north to catch the Gulf Stream except Cayman. So oh, okay. if, if you miss it, or if you turn too soon, you know, you end up like up in uh, like the schooner from down here a couple of months ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we've, all, we've always been important in the maritime, in the, in the world's maritime history. I mean, and then like I said, the supply of, of schooners and stuff came because we, we were known, you know, first of all, for food. Okay, I mean, and this is so, it's, it's so not ironic, but um, so. It, full circle that the Turtle Center is doing this now because the only thing that attracted boats to came on in the to actual stop here was food. Yeah. And if you read old maritime books, like I do all the time, you'd be amazed at how often came on is mentioned. Not in terms of anything else, but they were happy to get here because they knew going home they would eat a lot better than they ate coming in. Because coming in, they had salt beef and it rotted after the first month and they still had to eat it and everything. Yeah. They come to Cayman, you could get turtles live, put them on the deck, and they could have fresh meat all the way back to England. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's funny that the stories are more like, you know, yeah, <laughs> glad to get to the Caymans because you could get some food. They couldn't find water here, but they, uh, they, they stopped for the turtles to have fresh meat going yeah. back. Well, that pretty much corroborates all the information we came up with because we came up with a with a little saying that came out was pretty much a gas station of the Caribbean. Yeah. So once they yeah. enter the Caribbean, they stop at Cayman, they stock up, and they could go all the way down to Trinidad, or all the way back to, yeah, to, yeah. to, to Europe. And we have no fresh water rivers or anything, but they all came because that, 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 that's why they ate a lot better going back home than they ate coming over. <laughs> First of all, it started with better fresh meat, and, and, yeah. it, and it lasted on, oh. the, on the decks. And even if they weren't picking up supplies here like that, they needed to see Cayman. And because Cayman is so low and at night so hard to see, a lot of ships ran into Cayman. Mm -hmm. You know, he was like, okay, that's it, you're <laughs> <laughs> you know? And some of the best, I mean, the convert them was, you know, HMS, mm -hmm. uh, naval, naval ships, and they still ran into Cayman. So, mm -hmm. so a lot of history of Cayman, is, as we all know, is to do with maritime heritage. So schooners are, are an amazing thing. But that's just, Deviated just just for a little bit into cat boats. Okay. So is there is there any kind of relation between cat boats and and schooners? And I'll tell you why. Because in our research doing the Iron Man and wooden ships, both the first Cayman schooner and the cat boat both came out of the brack. Mm. Yeah, the first schooner I ever built was a twelve foot, twelve six foot schooner I built in the brack. Yeah. Um, they're like. Mother and daughter, our father and son. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, and they're uh, equal in importance to our history for different reasons altogether. Quite frankly, the cat boat was our pickup truck. Uh, a lot of people drive around the coast to Cape Man. They're so impressed, or they used to be so impressed that you could always see the sea that we built our roads next to the ocean, and you could see the ocean. Mm -hmm. But that's not really how it happened. Before we had cars and we had roads. The houses were built on the sea, and the catboat was how you went from house to house, and how you went from east end to north side. If you were in north side and you needed to go to the doctor for, you know, if you birth or, well, birth or anything like that, you had to get the catboat and come across. And that pertained for uh, pretty much 
60, 60, about 60 years. Uh, you know, until the early 60s, uh, we had cars and things here, but even then, we didn't have roads. I mean, the road yeah. to Rum Point was built when I was, you know, like 13 years old, you know. So you could always get to Rum Point in a cat boat or to, to anywhere else on the island. Uh, the, the relationship with the schooners um, is their work inside. That, that, the, 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 what, what they had, I mean, the pickup truck was the work inside too, but people, we call the schooners turtle and schooners. Right. The schooners didn't catch any turtle, didn't ever fish for turtles. The schooners left here with six, sometimes eight, I mean, the minute is 10 cat boats on deck. And they had two to four people for each cat boat. And they took those 700 miles away and dropped them in the middle of the sea. On a sand, what was a piece. sandbar with, with mangroves and stuff. They had to take their water from Cayman. They had to take the sticks to build the hut on the sandbar so you weren't sleeping in the water, so, so you didn't have to sleep in. Mm-hmm. And you did leave them there three months and during the hurricane season, okay? And the 300 odd names that you see in town are people that when they went back to look. You didn't find anything. You left 30 people there two, three months ago, and it's, it's, it's gone. There's nothing. Hurricanes just killed so many Caymanians, and large numbers from families, particular families, you know, because these people went on the boat together, their brothers and stuff. So you find a lot of, I mean, you know, and, and through the prominent families on the islands, a lot of them have lost a lot of people, and, you know, and, and over, over there. So the cat boat actually did the turtle fishing. They put out the nets, they caught the cat boats, they built what you call a crawl, you know what a crawl is. Mm-hmm. And uh, they would keep them there till the schooner came back and then they'd put them in the schooner. And they didn't bring the turtles back to Cayman, by the way. The turtles went straight to Tampa. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, one or two, you know, of the cat uh, would, you know, they, they, they would bring to Cayman and stuff, but they, it, they, the trade was international for, for, for turtle meat. Uh, they, so the, the cat boat actually did the fishing. It became a part of the, of the schooner. Although they weren't built for the same reason, they weren't built for any, anything else. The cat boat is just a utility boat. Everything about a cat boat was to make it work better for the guy, whether it was loading it up with the turtles. I'll tell you a quick story about the cat boat that you probably wouldn't hear normally because it's part of the design. And when you study naval architecture, you realize why it's like that. But the Cayman cat boat has a, what you call a, a, a a rounded chine, it doesn't have sharp chines, it's smooth all the way around. Mm-hmm. Um, it makes the boat tipper, so we have to put a lot of ballast in the boat to, to keep it from being so tipper. And you wonder why they would build the boat that way. Well, once again, it gets back to the turtle. If you got a 300 pound turtle in the net, there's no way you can lift it up even a foot to get it into a boat. With the Cayman Cat boat, one guy can put a turtle in the boat. You step to the side of the boat, the boat will tip over. Okay. okay. You can bring the gunner right down to the water, drag the turtle in, and then you step back, and it just levers the turtle into the boat. And you'll see pictures in the book of 10, 15 turtles in a boat because the turtle yeah. fitted, the back of the turtle fitted between the ribs on the boat. That, right. that was also part of the design of the boat. So it's just all utility. <laughs> now there's all these romantic stories about it, but it really, those people did what worked to make the boat do what it needed to, to, to get done. And with the res- end result is a Cayman cat boat that you got, which is a unique, a very unique boat and a really nice boat, you know. Yeah. So it's funny how it evolved, you know, o- o- over the, the years of it. But the first cat boat was built in 1905 and uh, by uh, Mr. Jarvis yeah, and Cayman back um, it, The Terra, he built three, he built the, the Terra. The, but the first one was the um, Ajax was the first one. and. Captain Eldon has, uh, Ira Walton did three cat boats off the Ajax, the actual ribs from the Ajax. Um, Captain Eldon, John Stafford, and David Foster um, paid to get them built. So we still have one of those boats, um, looks like brand new today, due to Mr. Kim, that is Black Cat. That's David Foster's boat. He, he gave that boat back to the Cat Boat Club, and we keep it, you know, they, uh, finance, keeping it up, and we keep it in excellent condition. So, yeah. so why do they call it a cat boat? Um, I can tell you the real, the, the, the real reason why you call a boat like that a cat boat, but this one has ha, has a bit of folklore uh, to go with it, okay? And folklore may be just as true as the other thing, but to start off with the, the real definition of a cat boat is in a boat with a single mass, 
that is stepped as far forward as possible on the board, as close to the belly of the board as possible. Okay. So one mast, long boom, and then that's a cat boat. It's a cat boat. It's actually a cat rig boat. But, or we just call them a cat okay. boat, okay? So you'll, and the strange thing is, you'll only find these boats either in the dysphoria of Cayman Islands and the Bay Islands and San Andres, uh, which do exactly the Cayman cat boat, because Caymanians went over there and introduced them to yeah. it, and in New England. Nowhere else in the world, no manufacturer besides a, a, a man crossbred cat boats in New England ever made cat boats. <laughs> so that's how unique it is to the Cayman Islands. But I, I, that's why I mentioned the connection between Cayman and New England going back 100, 150 years, for like 100 years it was. So, I mean, but so close. Joshua Slocum, the first man to sail around the world, you've heard about him. Yeah. He was coming down to, if you read the book, he's, he was coming to summer in Cayman. He used to come down to Cayman all the time. And he, that's when he got lost at sea. If you read the magazine, with, with, you know, they did a 100 year thing on him the other day. But it was that closer connection. Strange enough, I mean, Boston is way up there, you know, mm -hmm. Halifax yeah. is way up there, you know. Lunenburg, Lunenburg is where they built the, the, the Bruno's boat that I was telling you about. It has yeah. such an influence on Cayman Swoners and it completely changed the design of Cayman Swoners down here. Because everybody switched to it because it was just a better design. And even with the Cayman Swoners, these were fit for purpose more than for looks. Mm -hmm. They, they looked good, people liked them, but they, they, it wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't a part of building the boat. You know, it was to build a boat to go fast, take cargo, and get back home. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they, 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 the boat builders, their proportions just made it look, look right. A schooner, by the way, is as opposed to a cat boat, which is one mass forward. A schooner is in a boat with two masts or more. It can, be, it can be up to, it can be as many as you want. The biggest one I ever built was six masts but two or more masts, where the first mast is shorter than the second mast. Okay. Okay, because if it's the other way around, it's a yawl, and then you get a sloop. In the, the, well, these are all the categories of, yes. sail, of sailboats, but a schooner, anytime you see a picture of a boat, whether it has the sails up or not, if you look at the mast and the front mast is shorter than the second one, it's a schooner. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that is a lot. This is, this is great, because I'm hoping that people get to read this book and, you know, like you say, there's a lot that you can go on and on about. But, uh, you know, this is a good time to take another break. And, you know, we're going to come back and maybe talk to Miss Susie about some of her favorite stories. <laughs> Enjoy a summer of adventure at Camp Shelby, Cayman Turtle Center's very own summer camp for kids aged 5 to 12 years old. Learn about turtles, sharks, birds, and more. Explore the wildlife and splash in the pool. Campers can even take part in a special animal release. Weekly and daily passes are available this July and August. Find out more and register now at CampShelby.com. So, hello guys, we are back again to the green scene. My name is Gaddis Islop from Cayman Turtle Center and I'm talking with Mr. Jerris Miller and Miss Susie Soto about turtles and schooners, our maritime heritage. So Mr. Jerris, can you tell me, what do you think? Uh, Cayman's turtle and heritage, how important is that? So, well, how, how important do you think that is Cayman in, in all your work to this book together, putting this book together? The turtle and heritage is what I gave Cayman a uh, lot more of a world, world use, especially Cayman and men. Um, it led down, down the, the true history to the explosion with seamen, national boat carriers and stuff. You know, it, it, Caymanians were already known abroad for being with seamen from the turtle and trade uh, before. A uh, unique thing about Cayman and the Cayman turtlers is, first of all, all those turtles that Columbus saw when he came here, Caymanians didn't eat them out, okay? By 1620, the Europeans had eaten all the turtles out of the Cayman waters, okay? Yeah, that's the same thing that yeah. we found out, yes. <laughs> and the Cayman wasn't even occupied, didn't even, I mean, have, you know, wasn't considered inhabited. So let's get that straight, first of all. Uh, we didn't eat the turtles out of the sea. <laughs> but it is really important to us because of, of, of the, how I think it, it allowed Cayman to become brave enough to be on the world stage. And whether it's to the seamen and later to banking and tourism, I think Cayman, Cayman as a 
small advanced back order players had the chutzpah to go out and, and become true. known in the world, okay? Mm-hmm. And, and there's, if you, you don't have to go far to find examples of other small islands that just don't do that, okay? I mean, they're, they're, we're the exception rather than the rule, and I think yes. the exposure that Cayman got internationally during the turtling years, because Caymanians are unique in that they didn't catch turtles out of the Cayman. None of the, the turtling trade has never been catching turtles out of the Cayman waters, ever, ever, ever. The unique thing that Caymanians did that other people weren't able to do was actually understand the turtle and the life cycle of the turtle. So Caymanians would go, the same turtle that would come here and lay on our beach, okay? Mm-hmm. The Caymanians would catch them while they were here. They would catch them in there. They, would, they, they knew they would go to Cuba, up around the Isle of Pines for several years. And when, the reason they went to Nicaragua, because when they got to be you know, large size, two and three hundred pounds, that's where they stopped before they, like the months before they actually came in, and, and you had the hat that laid on the beach and all the islands came on and any other island that they had come from. But Caymanians figured out how, what turtles were doing so they could go and actually be there and catch the turtles. And it was the weirdest places in the world that they just went. I mean, to, to, to think that you would leave your family, go to the coast of Nicaragua, and live in, on sticks in the sea, for two or three months, okay? Mm-hmm. Because that's where the, 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 the turtles, and to this day, scientists talk about the lost years with turtles. The old Cayman people knew where they went in the juvenile years, you know, they, they weren't lost to them, okay? Yeah. They would know from going to the grounds in Cuba what the harvest were gonna be next year, the year after, because of what the activity you're seeing there at that age group, and then they would move, the, the, the turtles, like, in, in mass, move on to these different geographical areas and they would actually go, and in no other country in the Caribbean did that. Nicaragua and them, even that close to them, didn't go out and, and do it for themselves. They all caught turtles, and like they do today, up until today in Mexico, when they come up on the beach. Mm-hmm. They never ever went into the ocean, into the sea, and understood how the turtle lived, where he slept, and everything else, so that you could, you know, set your nets and, and, and catch it. So it's, it, it has been so tied into to Cayman because of that, when, when, and when they shipped to the Tampa and Key West, this was exported all over the world. I was in Newport, <coughs> Rhode Island, um, a couple of years ago with my son. And America's Cup was there for many, many, many years. America's Cup sailing race, mm-hmm. biggest race in the world. And in the yacht club, on the wall, is the menu from 1931. And guess what the soup is? Turtle soup. <laughs> Cayman turtle soup. Now that's soup, that is turtle soup. Cayman turtle soup. Okay, the, the menu is, it's, it's in the glass up on the, up on the wall, it's Cayman turtle soup. So I mean, that's how well known, and this was in the, in the 30s, okay? This was way, way back then. I mean, how well known it was. You know, we had, the, that it was an industry that carried, you know, carried the island, it's what created the schooners. Because if it hadn't been a turtle tree, if there had been no need to have schooners, okay? Mm-hmm. They, the schooners wouldn't have been building around here, okay? And, and every Tom, Dick, and Hart, because it's amazing how many different people and families built like schooners, okay? There's guys that never mm. built a boat, built a boat in the backyard. Many of them went out there and never came back in it. But it was a lucrative trade, you know, at, at the time, and you could get in it. So if it hadn't been for the turtles, for the turtle, I don't think we would have been. We certainly wouldn't have had the reputation when, when steamships came in. Mm-hmm. And people like Ludwig was looking for, you know, for, for crew. And as soon as he got some of the Cayman Yons, it, it, everything was, you know, they, they, it, it just snowballed. I'll tell you a story that's in the book. Uh, when they were building the highway to Key West from uh, Miami to from, oh, the Overseas Highway, mm-hmm. came, a lot of Cayman Yons went and worked on this highway. And the uh, flag levels who built the road, the railroad down, down there. And his, he, there was a story that he had in the, uh, the, I think it was the New York Times or whatever, and he mentioned that the best crew he had was uh, the uh, Caymanian crews that worked there. But he mentioned it in the context that come the first, the week before Christmas, when if you got, they got paid on Friday, 
everybody got an abort and went home for Christmas. And they didn't tell your boss, you didn't, you just left. <laughs> <laughs> you just, every single came on. <laughs> Whichever school I was leaving the week before Christmas, you got paid and you went home for Christmas. Wow. And they, he said they, would, they wouldn't tell you, they would just show back up for the second week in January. And he was more than happy to hire them right back home because they were such productive people. True. But oh. they would not work over Christmas. Mm -hmm. And and that went into the seamen and things like my father and stuff. I mean, Christmas, the seamen came home, you know, they brought their money and stuff and they came home and it was, you know, a good time. But from way back then with the schooners when they were building that, you know, and I think I said that was the story he was telling about his crew. It was just like, you know, pick up their tools, walk to the boat, <laughs> and then bye bye. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh. Gone, gone home for Christmas. Wow, but you have some really good stories. And he does. What are some of the favorite stories that come out coming out of this book that people can look out for? So maybe you or Miss Susie can share some of them. Well, he's doing so well. I'm just fascinated listening to him. I, uh, my husband was about 12, and he had two older brothers that went out fishing uh, on the, um, the a sh a ship, a schooner named the Hustler. And uh, he, he loved these brothers so, so much. And they went on because it was very hard to find work in the old days. And a lot of the people that were building the ships, um, they gave jobs to their, their families. And so some of the more poor Caymanians didn't get to do. So they were kind of forced to go out on some of the ships to earn money for, to support their families. So they had uh, uh, these two, 121 and 116, um, had a younger brother and a younger sister and a mother to support. And so they went out on the RL Hustler. And they were down by Honduras. And there was a, another ship that was by them. Um, that was following around them. And the two captains were friends, Captain Connolly from East End and a Captain Laurie, who was captain of Hustler. And the two of them got together and they were chatting. And Captain Connolly said, we need to turn around and go back down to, down to Honduras in that area uh, because I think there's bad weather coming. And Captain Laurie felt it was dust, as I think the word Jerris, is that correct, what they would say? It's just dust. Well, unfortunately, it wasn't just dust. And that is the, the, the thing that Captain Laurie, they parted ways. And Captain Laurie, the dust got worse and worse and turned into a hurricane. And Captain Laurie had a crew, I think it was three young men that were not that experienced. And so he said, I want you to tie me to, my, to, to the wheel, and I want you to go below, and I want you to stay there. He explains the agony in the book. But I came across a letter of eight pages that he wrote and sent to the acting commissioner of the Cayman Islands on New Year's Day in 1941. And it was so beautiful that I insisted it be in the book as it was transcribed when it got to Cayman Islands. And the, it is here, and I can tell you, every Caymanian man who was a seaman cried reading this letter. I cried. A lot of people cried. Did you cry when you read it, <laughs> Jerris? <laughs> anyway, it is very touching. But how it starts out, it says, the acting commissioner of the Cayman Islands, your honor, a happy new year to you, sir. I wish to write you and a sad story of the ill-fated hustler and myself in which I am asking of you, sir, to have it read in every town and village by some of your intelligent clerks. 
how I came to save myself and crew and every father, every mother, every loving brother, every loving sister, and every true friend that hears my letter read, it must bring tears into their eyes. But before her going any further, and then he goes on to say, I must mention my history and Captain um, Larry's history because they were friends and he wanted to give Captain Laurie all honor in writing this letter, which was so touching. So this letter fits in here. I said I will be very provoked. I probably use stronger language. I will be very provoked if anybody changes one letter or one word in, in, in Captain Connolly. Captain Connolly, for me, stand a very good captain. Um, I would be provoked if anything is changed in, in this letter, and it, it is not, and it's totally beautiful how it is written. So um, later they found, um, they found potatoes floating. I think that was the first thing they found, potatoes, and they knew that they were from, from Hustler but there were 13 lost. And as Jaris mentioned before, I think there was another family with three lost on her and then uh, uh, Bob's two brothers. And that's when Bob was um, 12 or 13 and he, he had to become the, the one to earn the money for his family. And then he went into the service at 16 by telling a story about his age, which I probably shouldn't tell, but it, <laughs> anyway, that's how the men, this is iron men, these are iron men, these Caymanian men. And I want the young people to read this. I want the young people in the schools to feel what Captain Connolly did when he was tied three days to the, to the wheel how they endured trouble, how they had faith. They had faith in God. They prayed. And if you don't go to sea and you don't pray, you, you will. Forget, forget about going to sea. Anyway, so um, it's, just, it's just a beautiful story. So um, I've done two paintings of this one. Um, and then there's all sorts of stories like this. The gold field um, was a beautiful ship. I think it took her, she could make it from here to Tampa in 72 hours. Is that correct? I believe it was 72 hours. She was fast. What a beautiful ship she was. But um, unfortunately, she, she, she had a great life. Uh, she was in movies, and um, but she came back to Cayman, and she's laid to rest in the North Sound. So that's a sad story. Now we have another ship that we hope is coming on, uh, that we is is going to be coming back to Cayman, called Fairweather, and I actually was lucky enough to speak to the captain of Fairweather about four years ago. And um, she was for sale. And fortunately, some uh, people have gotten together and purchased her. And she's now in Gloucester, getting refurbished. Um, she was built in Sir Anthony Jenkinson's shipyard in Jamaica. But she was, she was started to be built in Foster's shipyard in the Brack. Yeah, and Caymanians built her. Caymanians uh, built her. That's who worked for Anthony Jenkins. His, his whole crew was Caymanians that he yep. up there. And that was and the last boat built by Caymanians. It was after the, the, it was after the Scona trade had that sort of died. Yep. Yeah. And so Anthony Jenkinson commissioned this one. And he, and he, brought, he brought the Caymanians over to yes, Jamaica and to finish them. Caymanians so finished right, her in Jamaica. Jamaica. Yep, yeah. yep, yep. But Caymanian workers. Caymanian workers both, both finished her. His, his whole crew was, he took it to yeah. change location. But, but yeah. in here are the pictures of her. And she ended up um, being purchased by a family 
um, and um, she it was a husband, a wife, and four children. I think they were 16, that 16 down to about eight. And they went around the world once with the husband. They ran into a storm, the husband got off. And um, the mother, her name is Captain Suddy. The story of Captain Suddy is in here and how she and four children went around the, the world another time the first, the first without female, the father, the first female, the first female, female. to ever do it. And she, I wish she As could come <laughs> for our opening. I wish she could come for our opening. Yeah. But anyway, that story is in here. But then she ended up in Spain and is now in Gloucester being worked on. And um, I believe she will have birth here when she gets here by the government down next to the Capitol Club. Oh, so that's kind of exciting. Good. I'm very excited about it. So it's been around the world twice. So Anthony Jenkinson, Sir Anthony, his son Sir John Jenkinson, is very much involved in it. So I keep a check on him, and um, I've spoken to the guy in charge of the project. So it's been a lot of fun for me. I'm hoping she sails somewhere, maybe from Miami to here. I want to be on her. But oh, I, I hope I can get a ride home on her. I can, me too, I hope I can me get too. A her ride home. Anyway, so here it is, are the pictures of her. And um, she was outfitted in, I believe it was Hong Kong, and she's just beautiful on the inside. And so that's one of our most exciting things. The other one was in the Keys. Um, what is her name again? Um, the Western Union. The Western Union, and I, I went on her. My husband and I had a sail on her, but I think it was one of the last. The Western, I'll, I'll Western you Union. I'll, I'll tell Go you on, you, you, Western you Union. tell, yes, please. The Western Union is named after the company of Western Union. Oh, yeah. Um, when they, the very first on the border cable, communication cable ever laid was from uh, Key West to Havana, and then on up from Key West to Tampa. This, when Western Union wanted a boat built to be able to lay cable, they came to Cayman. The arch had built the, the whole frame of the boat, everything, okay, here in Cayman, the keel, everything else. But Western Union at the time was a U.S. government company. And the U.S., they had, there's a, I forget what the name of the bill is, but they could only buy from U.S. I'm sorry, for them to buy the boat, it had to be built in the U.S. So the, all this was put together, mm -hmm. taken apart, put on another Cayman schooner, <laughs> taken up to, um, to Key West, and put together there so you could say that it was built on U.S. soil. Oh. <laughs> because at that time, the federal government couldn't, uh, they, that, they, they had to spend the, yeah. the money in, but they wanted the Cayman boat builders to build the boat. And they knew, they knew enough about that. So it was built to, Lay this, these cables down, and it, you can. It's on dry dock right now, getting some refurbishing. But then they're doing sunset cruises, you know, out of Key West and up until quite recently. Beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. um, schooner. It, they've taken it, it, it had a wheel and stuff on the front for the cable, but they've turned it back to like a, you know, a, a schooner now. Um, and that's the way it is up there. It's, it's oh God, it's 90, about 90 years old. And, but they, the U.S. government, came to Cayman. They had all the expertise and all the boat building expertise you got in the United States. They came to Cayman to get, to get up, to get the boat built for, uh, for and laid the first cable and the first underwater cable ever for communications. Wow. Okay, well, guys, this has been amazing. This is, this book itself is a, this could be a national treasure. It is a national it treasure. Is. Are you done with us for a few minutes? Well, yes. <laughs> Pause. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I'm, I'm ready rolling. <laughs> I'll talk. Pause. Okay. When I Great. heard this story from Captain Kent Eldemeyer about his his great-grandfather, Captain Stedman Bodden, who I believe is a relative of yours. Mm, they are connected. And he told me about the building of the, the schooners. And, and Kent, when he was eight years old, said, why are you going through all of this 
work to do this iron? And he said, because I, will, I want to make strong steel, because I want the steel in the schooners. I want it strong, so it brings our Caymanian schooners home safely. And this, to me, is one of the reasons my passion, my heart, and my tears are wrapped up in this book. Wow. So, no, definitely, we got everybody should have this. So, Jess, can you just give us a quick thing? We're yes. Can I get this book? If you we have if, a launch coming up, but you said they can pre-purchase the book. Yep. The, um, the, the launch is on the fifteenth of, of um, July, and it's going to be at Cayman Turtle Center and in West Bay, Northwest Point, from 5 to 7 p.m. And the entire public is invited. It's free of cost. And if you want to purchase the book before the launch, uh, the launch will be, I mean, you can purchase it yourself, or we will have the book available on, you go to the website, C-L-M-P-U-B-L-I-S-H-I-N-G.com. At clmpublishing.com, and uh, there you can buy. You'd be able to purchase the book for forty-five dollars for the book. If you're a member of the Seafarers Association, um, you, you can, and you show proof of your membership for the Seafarers Association, you can get a, a, the book discounted to thirty-five dollars. And if you're a member of the Cayman Maritime Heritage Foundation or the Cayman Cat Boat Club and you can show proof of membership. You can be selling the book for $30. So it's available from CLM Publishing, which uh, online, which is actually the name of the company, the store is More Than Words Bookstore. And it's on the second floor of the Thompson Building in the middle of Georgetown, um, across the street from the Georgetown Post Office. And the contact person there, if you want to contact by phone, is Karen Chin. And her number is 926-2507. Okay, thank you so much, guys, for joining us today in the green scene. And, you know, we're really looking forward to that book launch. I hope as many people as, as can hear this will come out and see this and learn more about our maritime heritage. That's it for now. Thank you for joining us on our final episodes of season one of The Green Scene. We'll be taking a break for the summer, but there's plenty of things still happening at our center. So come and visit us. Our kids camp, Camp Shelby, is back for the summer. Find out more and register at www.campshelby.com. That's Shelby with two L's. Our evening hatching releases are back and we're offering a very special experience every Thursday starting the end of June and into July and August. You can visit us on social media or our website for more updates and happenings at the Turtle Center. You can follow us on Instagram at Tur Cayman Turtle Center, on Facebook, Cayman Turtle Center Island Wildlife Encounter, or visit our website, www.turtle.ky. Enjoy a summer of adventure at Camp Shelby, Cayman Turtle Center's very own summer camp for kids age 5 to 12 years old. Learn about turtles, sharks, birds, and more. Explore the wildlife and splash in the pool. Campers can even take part in a special animal release. Weekly and daily passes are available this July and August. Find out more and register now at CampShelby.com.